Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am going to formally invite you and um, welcome you to this session. I am Yoshiaki Abe. I am an operating advisor of the university. And I have just, I have two jobs, very simple job. One is uh, to thank uh, uh, NBA and uh, AMC of Japan for hosting this session. And uh, I know it's some them second one is I would like to get your permission for some of the cases that we are taking this and for the people who do have a, a strong objection. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's my job to ask your permission. Thank you very much. Enjoy your session. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you very much for participating in our event this morning. Uh, I am uh, Masatoshi Kawano, uh, a counselor at the Embassy of Japan. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to co-host this uh, exciting event uh, with the USJI and the NBI. Thank you very much. Uh, since I was appointed to uh, the embassy this past June, it's only uh, two and a half months ago, uh, we have been hearing you know, uh, news related to cyber security almost every day. The OPM breach case, the YouTube video of uh, the Jeep hacked and the remote control, control, and of course, uh, recently we see many articles uh, reporting the regarding uh, potential sanctions against China or something. Uh, on the fact sheet uh, of the U.S.-Japan cooperation uh, completed in April, uh, when Prime Minister Abe uh, this, this area, uh, strengthening and expanding our robust cooperation on cyber issues and uh, internet economy issues, were clearly dis described as the most important cooperation uh, area between the United States and Japan. Uh, personally speaking, I had the, myself had the honor uh, of working as one of the foundation members of the NIS, which is the uh, National Cyber Security Center for the government in Japan. So it is truly uh, my great, great pleasure uh, to organize this very exciting uh, event. And especially with uh, you know, attendance of Tsuchiya Sensei, one of the leading academic experts in Japan, and also someone whom I am closely working with while I was in Japan. I hope all of you deepen your understanding on the Japanese efforts in this area, and I'm excited to have uh, this many participants uh, this Friday morning. Only one more thing, uh, please fill out the questionnaire. Uh, you will see it in the, uh, give us your feedback. It will be very, very helpful to us. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, thank you very much for your participation. And I'd like to uh, hand this microphone now to Mr. Troy Kampen. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your welcome and introduction. It's our privilege at NBR to partner with USJI once again and our colleagues at the, at the Japanese Embassy. Uh, today's topic is, I, I think, uh, obviously one of great interest to many, uh, but the approach and the angle that we'll take today, and we look forward to Tsuchiya Sensei's uh, presentation, is really uh, one that's outside the Washington echo chamber on cyber issues. I'm sure we will, uh, when we hear from Rob, in either some of his discussion or in the questions that you all ask at the end, reflect some on what our experiences here are in Washington, particularly as we look forward to this visit next week. Uh, but uh, let's first start with hearing the important perspectives that, that Professor Suchia has uh, from a Japanese point of view, and let them inform our thinking and our, and our own questions um, in the discussion to follow. Um, just a word, 
Professor Suchi is, is a professor at KU University's <coughs> Graduate School of Media and Governance and a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Global Communications at the International U University of Japan. Uh, he's been a government researcher. He has been uh, a, a resource to the government of Japan. He's also been a visiting scholar here in Washington. Uh, well, was he in Washington or was he in Hawaii at the East West Center? You remember in Hawaii? He was here. Um, and he's published widely on cybersecurity and international relations. He is a, a scholar of international relations, and so his perspectives on these issues are uh, informed by his um, diplomatic discipline. Rob Sheldon is uh, a director of policy for the business executives for national security. Uh, and uh, Rob, maybe when, when you start, you can give a brief word or two about Ben's and, and your experience there. He's worked on the Hill um, and uh, brings a wide range of experience uh, on this issue, both from a congressional perspective, I think, and from the, from the private sector as well. And so we look forward to their presentations. You are welcome to either present um, what might be best to present from up here since both of you have slides. So, for that, that's just you. I should mention at the outset, I hope it's apparent, but our discussion is on the record, uh, both the presentations and the questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Motohiro Jia, so it's a little bit longer uh, for you to remember, actually. So American people cannot pronounce two, but Chinese people, it's easy to pronounce two. So, so uh, I'm always trying to explain what's the pronunciation of my name, so, but you are very good. <laughs> I cannot pronounce your family name, actually, so it's very difficult. <laughs> anyway, so, um, I'm very happy to back to Washington. So I spent, my wife and I spent one year here uh, in Washington 14 years ago. It was the time of 9-11. Um, um, it was very tough to uh, live here as a foreigner. But, so my experience here changed my research topic too. So before that, I was just looking at the brighter side of the internet. So global one deployment, mobile internet, freedom of expression and things like that. But I found that um, bad guys are using the internet for bad purposes. So uh, the terrorist room was, room was using the internet to book their flights, their hotels, and they're communicating with the Middle East or something like that. So I thought um, this uh, uh, topic will be bigger in the future. But after coming back from Washington to Tokyo, so the Japanese professor said, oh, that's not a good topic, you should not follow it. But I did, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start from the old name of uh, cyber attack, DDoS, D-D-O-S. It's a distributed denial of services attack. So the famous uh, uh, example is 2007. So Estonia was attacked by DDoS attacks. Estonia was uh, part of the uh, Soviet Union in the Cold War era. So, but they don't want to be uh, a part of the Russian uh, influence anymore. So in the center of the uh, capital city, uh, Tallinn, there was a big statue like this. So um, um, Estonian people wanted to move this statue to suburb. But the news was reported in Russia, so uh, Estonia uh, started to gain uh, a lot of uh, accesses from all over the world. So how DDoS works? So DDoS uh, was distributed uh, a lot of uh, computer viruses to third-party computers. You might be infected, but you never realize that you were infected. But suddenly, the attacker start uh, accessing, uh, uh, commanding those infected computers. The computers uh, start accessing a target uh, at one time. So you will see a lot of access into your servers, computers, so it's just like that um, hundreds of people, thousands of people are in front of your house, so they are knocking on your door. So it's, it's, it's disturbing, it's, it's um, uh, troublemaking. But no one dies. So DDoS is attack, so-called attack, but no one dies by DDoS attack. 
It happened in the United States in, on July 4th of 2009. So July 4th is a national uh, independence holiday. So people were just relaxing, but they found that DOD, Treasury, DHS, FCC, uh, other uh, media sites getting a lot of access from all over the world. You cannot distinguish real access and uh, computer virus access. So they had to shut down some websites or something. But three days later, so the same attack went on to South Korea. So they found that uh, a flood of accesses to Blue House. Blue House is a uh, White House in South Korea. The Congress, Ministry of Defense, uh, photo size, financial size. So we were surprised. Japanese people were surprised. Our ally, United States, was attacked. Our neighbor, South Korea, was attacked. Why not us? A uh, later investigation found that eight servers in Japan were involved in attacking site. So we were not victims. We were uh, helping the attack. So it was July 2009. What's happening in Japan? In uh, next month, so Democratic, Pe uh, Democratic Party of Japan took the administration. It's a big, big change of politics in Japan. So uh, DPJ government, DPJ government couldn't respond to these uh, cyber attacks. They thought it might be a very serious issue, but they couldn't make any policy decision. Several months later, in December 2009, Chief Cabinet Secretary finally made a speech that the government, Japanese government, cannot deny that Japan could be targeted uh, by such cyber attacks. Dealing with cyber attacks is an important national security and crisis management issue. So I was invited to join the government council around this time. And we made a, a, a first a strategy called Information Security Strategy for Protecting the Nation. So we try to heighten our security, our cyber security, and we want to try to uh, protect the nation. But several months later of this uh, strategy, in September 2010, we had a, a serious incident in the east of China Sea. Chinese uh, fishing boat crashed into the Japanese Coast Guard's boat. There was huge discussion in China and Japan too. And Chinese young people went on the streets and they made a very serious anti large anti-Japanese demonstration. This demonstration went online, naturally. So we found this posting, uh, this kind of post, post uh, on, Japanese, uh, on Chinese websites. So they say um, uh, China must attack Japan online. So if you print this page, it will be seven pages long. There are a number of lists of uh, targets in Japan. So including cabinet, uh, uh, prime minister's office, and uh, main ministries, and including uh, comic author's website or something. So it was quite strange. But Japanese government also watching this post. Usually Chinese Communist Party deletes these kind of postings, but they didn't. But the Japanese government also watching. And we were waiting for traffic coming into Japan. So we were watching, uh, we were monitoring communications. Then after we found that uh, traffic is increasing, we just cut off the uh, traffic. So there was no, almost no damage at that time. So we were ready. So DDoS is something like this, so no one dies. So it should be okay if you have enough bandwidth to deal with. A second type, APT is more serious. It's called Advanced Persistent Threat. On March 11, 2011, uh, this is the day we cannot forget. We had uh, big earthquakes and tsunamis in Japan in uh, Tokyo area. This is picture was taken in my mother's <coughs> hometown. So um, my mother passed away. 20 years ago, so she was not affected. But my uncle and his family is, is still living there. They were okay, but more than 1,000 people died in this town. And I want to thank American people. So Operation Tomodachi was very, very helpful. So my uh, immediate family was thanking uh, your uh, uh, operation. 
So we were very happy to be with you. Thank you very much. But 20 days later, uh, on March 31st, 2011, we found that there were bad guys too. Government official received emails uh, titled Yesterday's Radiation Day. We were worrying about Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. So we, all of Japanese people are watching this plan for radiation. And it, it was quite natural for the government people to open up attachments of the email. And they included uh, customized files. And they stole a lot of information from Japanese government website and uh, classified computers by the So it was huge shocking scandal for us, actually. And several months later, in August 2011, uh, another eye-opening event happened. So Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, one of the Japanese biggest military contractors, uh, was penetrated. More than 80 uh, servers and computers were uh, compromised. And probably they lost uh, military technology information including American technologies. So because we, Mitsubishi Heavy Industry and other uh, American companies are helping each other. So we still don't know what kind of information was really stolen, but it was a huge shock for us. So political leaders were angry with this event, and they said, what's happening here? But later investigation found that all the passwords of diet members were stolen by somebody. So somebody was reading their messages by world. So we try to uh, heighten our cyber security more. Then we uh, 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 made this cyber security strategy uh, two years ago. So I was sitting on the other side of the table. So. <laughs> <laughs> no one was interested in it actually. <laughs> and we set up a, a cyber defense unit in the self-defense forces. And uh, November last year, uh, we passed the Cyber Security Basic Act. So a basic act usually is that a mid-term, long-term uh, policy direction. So we want to strengthen our cyber security more. But in that month, November uh, 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 last year, we found another big hacking uh, incident. It was Sony Pictures. Sony Pictures Entertainment is an American company. Uh, Sony brand goes back to Japan, so Japanese people are also upset. What, what's happening? And um, um, this movie was a trouble making. So I was in actually Hawaii last year as a visiting scholar of the East Coast Center. So I watched this movie. Uh, it's a very very funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the movie said. Uh, Kim Jong Un doesn't have this thing, but uh, so he had it actually. So, English, I should have talked to some records. But um, we were very surprised that um, FBI said the North Korean government is responsible for these uh, actions. So, um, this kind of thing could be a cyber war. Um, former uh, Defense Secretary. Uh, then finally said, collective results of these kinds of attacks could be cyber problem and attacks that would cause physical destruction and loss of life. So DDoS, APTs don't kill anyone, but in the future, so people might be killed by cyber uh, attacks. So US government, your government saying that this is a change of operational domains. So all the operational domains were land, sea, and air. But fourth operational domain is outer space. And the fifth uh, operation of the main is cyberspace. But it is shared space. So cyberspace is just an, an aggregation of devices, channels, and storages. So interconnected devices is just cyberspace. So IT company says the internet is cloud. Cloud, uh, cloud service is very attractive. You should go cloud or something like that. But the real uh, um, uh, figure of the Cloud is serverless. This is a picture of Google data center. So if you like this picture, you are key. But this is a real 
uh, cyberspace. And if you go underground of the Tokyo streets, you will see these kind of pipes, actually. So there are huge tunnels under the streets of Tokyo. And they were connected underground, actually. And if you want to subscribe optic fiber services at home, so somebody will come to your house and put the cable. This is cyberspace. So this is very, very vulnerable uh, uh, space, actually. And I want to show an example. So I Google uh, data centers in New York City. New York City is, has many, many financial sectors. And these spots are uh, 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 co-location centers of uh, uh, servers, actually. It was available online. I didn't do any spy acts in New York City. So it was available online. And um, so these are more focused uh, map. So these are uh, uh, five spots are most attractive uh, data centers in New York City. You can identify them. You know where it is. And I found that um, the top one is this section, this spot, and it is owned by Google. So you can attack this site, and you will lose the financial information. And second one is Verizon Business. So this is a very old uh, co-location side of service. It started in uh, telegraphic age, actually. So everybody knows where to attack. So cyberspace is not something floating in the cloud. So it is a physical uh, space, and it's quite easy to break it down. So we are uh, dependent on very vulnerable commerce. So who can protect us? Who can protect the cyberspace? There are lots of lots of cyber mercenary soldiers these days. So people say this country is attacking the United States, this country is attacking the Japan, and things like that. But actually, so mercenary soldiers, cyber mercenary soldiers are doing such kind of thing. So we have to counter these attacks. Then we have to have geeks on our side. Who are geeks? So here's a very famous um, um, graphic of a uh, typical uh, geek by uh, Jane Kilton. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have these people on our side to defend us. And the most notorious geek is Edward Snowden. He betrayed your government. But he was geek, and he was very talented. He got a lot of money by his technology. But they are good geeks too, of course. Um, good example is Barry Page and Sergey Brin, Google founders. They were just graduate students of Stanford University. And of course, Bill Gates. He was a king. But he got a lot of money. He's one of the richest men in the world now. And Steve Jobs. He was a typical geek, actually. And you probably don't know Linus Tobos. He's a leader of Linux project. So maybe you say you are not using Linux, but 70% of web servers in the world are using Linux. So you are using Linux. So we are dependent on them. So IT is controlling social systems, and we are dependent on gigs. But they say they don't want to work for the government. They say, why we must work for a government with a respect and money? So if they work in a black market, they can get a lot of money from bad guys. Why they have to work for them? That's our dilemma. So patriotic geeks are needed for us. So uh, IT system is becoming a black box these days. You cannot fix it easily. So you can maybe uh, fix a flat tire, but you cannot fix very high smart cars, actually. So in May 2015, so the uh, Japanese government tried to renew uh, cybersecurity strategy. And Prime Minister Abe said we have to do more. And our new idea of cybersecurity is free, fair, and secure cybersecurity. We almost tried to finish the drafting of the uh, strategy, but uh, Japan pension service was hacked. We lost a lot of pension records. Pension records cannot be converted into money easily. Uh, we lost more than uh, 100 mili uh, 1 million uh, pension records. All the people very angry. Where's my money? But 
I think pension records was were not a primary target. At that time, many of government agencies and ministries were under cyber attacks at the same time. I believe more than 30 government agencies were attacked during that period. So they wanted to get um, information through uh, these kind of servers. So core ministries are now high uh, uh, cyber security readiness, but other uh, related agencies are have lower security uh, preparedness. Now attackers going to the out, um, uh, uh, outer side and going to the deeper and deeper into the core of the Japanese government. I think it happened in the United States too. So OPM lost a lot of privacy uh, uh, information. So we are worrying about the Tokyo Olympic Games schedule in 2020. So um, we might get a lot of cyber attacks during the games. And we didn't want to repeat the Fukushima Korea nuclear plant uh, incident during those games. So if we had another uh, nuclear plant incident by cyber attacks, it would be a disaster for Japan and other countries. So we are consulting with the uh, UK government. So UK government said, so uh, GCHQ was helping, uh, getting help from the NSA. So NSA is notorious these days, but they are helping uh, other countries too. So I want to evaluate their help, their support actually. But our problem is that no such agency in Japan. We don't have Japanese version of NSA, we don't have Japanese version of GCHQ. Because uh, our article, our constitution, article 21 of the, our constitution prohibits wiretapping in any way. So we are not helping anybody in Japan without a court order. And it's very limited. As far as I know, only 20 cases were uh, using the wiretapping in Japan for one year. So we are very limited. And telecom telecommunication business law also prohibits wiretapping. So this is a civil liberties versus uh, uh, national security issue. So we are facing it now. So what can we do now is making an international alliance with the US and other countries. We are talking with US government, UK government, Indian government, uh, Estonian government, uh, ASEAN, EU, NATO, and other countries. And at the United Nations, group of governmental experts, GGE, is discussing how we can apply international norms to cyberspace too and how we can stop the escalation of the uh, uh, cyber attacks going to a real war. It's a complex building measures. We're talking about it, but we cannot make a good agreement. China and Russia are always saying that cyberspace is a new domain. We have to make a new treaty to govern cyberspace. But the US government, Japanese government, European government says, no, 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 no. So cyberspace is not new. We can use existing international laws to cyberspace to govern. So what's the difference? So China, Russia, and other European companies, countries try to um, justify their control inside those countries. Well, we don't want to justify their censorship or other control uh, of the internet in those countries. So we should not start uh, any treaty negotiation. That's the government, uh, Japanese government, US government position. So um, this is almost final slide. So cyber security uh, is intelligence activities. So intelligence activities are somehow difficult. So we have to strike a balance between privacy, privacy, human rights, and national security concerns. And people tend to focus on software issues for cyber security. But we have to think about hardware and infrastructures. Um, we have to think about uh, every possible facilities to be had by uh, bad people. And final point is, is uh, possibility. We really need patent tweaks on our side. So it's quite a difficult, but we need them. So um, Japanese government is uh, trying to make uh, cyberspace uh, free fair and secure. So that's our vision, so the Japanese government's vision so far. 
and we want to strengthen our uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, practices and preparedness with U.S. government and other uh, countries in the world. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Unit under the Ministry of Defense 
and then some a lot of meaningful sort of tinkering at the cabinet level uh, in terms of, of how you know, the sort of top level strategy is created. But I, I, I mention this specifically because uh, I want to mention this next, which is sorry, that's the, that's the uh, acronyms we used, is this. Um, for as good as uh, Japan is doing at creating the structures and the processes and organizations, if you look at people who are actually going to be cyber operators, and we've had to make some really significant assumptions to come with these figures. They're not, they're not perfect by any means, and they're capturing something very specific, which is people who are in cyber uh, command or cyber command like institutions in these countries. You see that Japan, this is a forecast, because when the uh, cyber defense unit was initially announced, <coughs> They said, for instance, with about 90 folks. And then around Ichigaya, the Ministry of Defense type place, you know, those, the, uh, the rumors that would go up to 300, 400 in the next few years. So if we sort of project out to 2017, uh, which is when the U.S. is cyber comp slate, have 62, uh, 6,244 members, you can kind of see that, that the amount of uh, people that Japan has allocated that type of function doesn't necessarily square well with uh, potential uh, adversaries or at least security threats to the media alliance. So um, we can there's there's a lot of problems with this, and we tried I tried to control it a little bit for for I don't think we have time to go through this right now, but we can control it for military size, GDP, um, you know, a variety of other things. But the the point is that I think that where the rubber meets the road in the Japan case right now is trying to resource these types of things. Um, it is the case, I think, that Japan has a lot of other institutions that are in the game, so it's probably unfair to hold them to a standard, like, like us, very comfortable saying, we have cyber, com cyber command, it's great, and how big it's going to be, and, and that type of thing. In the Japanese case, if they decide to allocate the resources toward, you know, NPA, the National Police Agency, the Information Technology Promotion Agency, IPA, uh, JP CERT, some of those things, that's a, that's a reasonable thing. But having people who can operate uh, in an actual security is going to be uh, meaningful here. So um, maybe just a, a one more note about what the U.S. can do to help uh, improve cooperation and what we can do in the context of the alliance <coughs> will help set us off. Uh, in the U.S. case, I think you know we're talking about sanctions, and I think it's incumbent upon the United States to uh, sort of lead the way here, and then uh, Japan will sort of figure out a path uh, after, you know, maybe they're figuring it out right now, maybe they, maybe they will do something similar, maybe they won't, maybe it will be similar, but to us sort of stand, we can see what happens on that front. Uh, but in the U.S. case, it's, I think, incumbent upon us to take uh, leadership with some of the threats like that, like, like uh, China, for example. Um, I, this, is a, this is a pet peeve. I'd love to see the United States stop using the term emanating when we're characterizing threats, especially from China. We have cyber threats emanating from China. Okay, I get it. I mean, that was that was a few years ago, political sensitivities. You start seeing that, that, that term uh, appear in you know, U.S. strategy documents in 2008, 2009, or perhaps before that. But I think it's incumbent upon us to call space bait on this one if we're going to have a policy that's uh, at least somewhat hard line. Um, for the alliance, I would uh, I would think that the best approach for us would be to specialize and try and try and get to what are optimal uh, abilities for or what what are identify the things that we can bring to bear best and then invest in those things those things have to be so in the U.S. case um, you know there's there's some capabilities that we can get that Japan is is prevented from getting by you know constitutional constraints and so forth we should uh, we should have developed that for our part for the U.S. part. Uh, for the Japanese part, there's some things they can do. We had a picture of Edward Snowden up here uh, previously, and you know I think that there's you know there's a security interest for the United States in making sure that countries, for example, in Southeast Asia and Africa, are uh, defending themselves adequately from cyber threats. And if someone from the United States came and said, "Hey, uh, I have a deal for you. I'll help coordinate you know, your information, and share it, or I'll help train you," someone would probably say, "Take a hike." Uh, in the Japanese case, not necessarily so. They've done some great things in terms of doing capacity building in other countries, and it's something that Japan, I think, can uh, be an honest broker in that space and can should continue to develop. Uh, the final thing is uh, exercise, train, and share information. I don't really know what the 
mainly what the up to the minute status on that is because even when I was looking at it this you know full time it was sort of uh, was sort of a little bit unclear because there are so many things going on at once there are these little information sharing groups that happen you know through US, uh, US Forces Japan and, and all the service components have different programs going so it'd be interesting to do a survey and find out what the what the aggregate of all this is but uh, my assertion at this point is that it's not so much that we couldn't you know even consider doubling down the amount of exercises and training that we do uh, in this space, but perhaps someone here uh, <coughs> wants to challenge that or has some you know, more information to know is adequate or something like that. I just I'm kind of in a mode still where not, like none of this stuff can be adequate for my own you know, for my own uh, satisfaction. But that's where we are. So I think I'll leave it at that. And then I'll just, uh, thank you very much.